Welcome to another episode of the Man Cave Chronicles. Welcome to the party, pal. You're my boy, Blue. Yo, I did it. I did it. A podcast with interviews of amazing guests from the world of pop culture. Oh, yeah. TV. Nice. Movies. Oh, I love the movies. Comedy and more. From deep inside the Man Cave, your host, Elias. Siobhan, welcome to the cave. <laughs> Thank you very much for having me. How are you? What's new with you? Well, I'm I'm really well actually. I mean, considering we've got this whole lockdown thing kicking off, I'm actually I'm actually pretty pretty zen about it all. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what about yourself? I can't complain. You know, we're home with the family, and uh, you know, just every day is a new day, right? Yeah, completely, yeah. absolutely. How, how how are you treating with it? Like, what have you been doing? Oh, well, um, let's see. We It was funny, actually, because my husband and I moved about a week before everything really got bad, um, a couple months ago. So we were sort of in this new house trying to sort of, I don't know, make sense of everything. So we've had a lot to do, like unpacking and sorting and all that stuff. And um, so like on a, on a very candid level, <laughs> I've been like homemaking, to be honest. But um, uh, it's nice being in California doing that, you know, because the sun's always shining. So it's right. quite it's quite nice to sort of hang out in in that weather. But also, obviously, the album came out too. So That's right. there's been a lot of um, a lot of talk about that, and a lot of yeah, meeting nice people online and whatnot, chatting about it, mm-hmm. so, like yourself. <laughs> so you've been busy uh, the last few years. You know, you've done some acting, you're singing, and we'll talk about that. But for the listeners, really quick, uh, where are you originally from? I'm from uh, the UK. I'm from. Well, I lived in London for 13 years. Oh, well, how was it growing up there? Oh, it was amazing. I mean, London is like the most incredible melting pot. And um, I mean, the weather isn't that great, <laughs> but um, but the culture is beautiful. And it's obviously, you know, my hometown. So it feels it feels lovely. Whenever I think about London, I get a little bit homesick. But I'm actually from the Midlands in the UK. But, um, but London does feel um, just as much like home. Do you go there often to visit? I mean, yeah, we were supposed to be going back this summer, um, but obviously that's that's not going to happen anymore. But yeah, I try and go back a couple times a year. Mm. Now, like growing up there, did you have any idea that you wanted to get into like the entertainment business with singing and acting? Well, yeah, I mean, I was I was nine when I first started um, messing around with singing and acting. I went to see Grease the musical on stage in London with my family, and um, as I say, I was nine years old. I think I was eight actually. And when I came back uh, back home, my babysitter was a performing art. Um, uh, well, she was she was kind of obsessed. She was on the way to drama school, and she was putting on a gala um, to raise some money. And um, and I asked her if I could be in her show. And I was I think I had just turned nine at that point. And I sang, "Look at me, I'm Sandra D." We had to change a lot of the lyrics, but like that was when it first started. My first trip to London, saw Greece, and that sort of kicked off this this uh, obsession really and it, it didn't I mean the funny thing is when I got to um, the age when I when I should have been you know um, focusing on one thing I was focusing on so many I loved my fashion design and drawing and I was also acting and directing and I also loved singing and there's a couple of other things in between too so in the end I actually left school and went to study fashion at the London College of Fashion oh, wow. um, and it was a reality TV show that sort of kicked me back onto the performing arts path so um so yeah, and then I was 22 when I did that, and then I've been sort of on stage ever since. With you know, like other bits of arty stuff here and there. I started an interior design company and a few other bits and pieces, but <laughs> but yeah, I feel like my I was always pushed back onto the singing and acting path, no matter how hard I tried <laughs> to get away from it. So like, so like, like when you told your family, like this is what I want to get into, like what was their reaction? Well, my mum always wanted to be uh, a performer, and she used to teach English and drama. And my dad actually taught maths and science. That's how they met. So mum was sort of, I guess there was a moment where she was kind of living vicariously through me. She loved the idea that I wanted to be on stage because she'd always wanted to do it. Um, and um, and they're both just, they're just really cool parents, you know. Like, I basically essentially dropped out of university, um, of fashion school, to to enter the reality TV show. And then I had a record deal straight off the bat, and... You know, my parents were really cool about it. They were like, well, if this is what you want to do, then I guess, you know, you won't be getting a degree kind of thing, you know, so go for it. Just, you know, follow your heart kind of thing. So they were really supportive. Yeah, they, they I mean, my mum always says, you know, we, we weren't concerned about pursuing it because since you were so young, you were singing and acting and it just, we knew that you were destined for the stage. So they were, that was their stance on it anyway. 
So, so when you started taking like acting lessons and everything, like how would you describe that experience? Well, I actually first started with singing lessons. Okay. Um, I think I was, I think I was ten. I might even have been nine. It might have been around the same time when Mum said, "Like, what do you want for your birthday?" And I said, "I want singing lessons." And she was like, "All right then." <laughs> this girl knows what she wants, and that was always wonderful. It was like a, a little. I remember on a Wednesday night, Mum would pick me up from school and we'd go um, uh, to Richard Paul's singing lesson, and and uh, and I looked forward to it all week, you know, because it was. It just felt. It just felt right. You know, like when you feel like you're in flow creatively, it always felt like a bit of a sanctuary space to walk into that building. Um, and so singing really was where I sort of came home. Um, and then I started acting a little bit. But honestly, I, I found acting really difficult when I was a kid because I was bullied quite badly. It was very difficult for me to be around any other kids because <laughs> I just felt really inferior. So I think that's probably why also the singing was, was great for me because it was always just a singing teacher and me, you know, that I didn't have to deal with anyone else being mean <laughs> I guess to sort of deter me um so yeah I mean I was always I think that's probably honestly why I didn't feel confident pursuing uh the performing arts um after school because I just thought I didn't have a good enough chance because I hadn't been active in my acting um and similarly with the dancing there was a great dance school in in the city where I grew up but uh, the same people that bullied me at school for acting would bully me in the dance school so I kind of I kind of shied away from that um, and I think that's why I found the fashion design and uh, I used to love drawing and illustration so I think that's why I went to do that because I just didn't really fancy my chances as a performing arts student um, but I guess the universe had other plans when they kind of the reality TV show came in and then and then I was on stage you know so. yeah but I didn't really enjoy the yeah I didn't really do much of the singing uh, sorry the acting and the dancing until I got um, into the reality TV show, weirdly. Wow. So, and I noticed that you, yeah. when I was doing some research that, you know, you've performed in theater and stuff like that. Like, what's been, like, your favorite show that you've acted on or performed? Oh, I've I've been so lucky with the roles that I played. Like, my first my first uh, lead was um, Sally Bowles in Cabaret. I mean, any performer will know that that's just one of those roles that they don't come along very often, those sorts of roles. So that was one of my favorites by far. Um, but then also I played Molly in Ghost, and um, again the music in that show is just outstanding, it's just beautiful. Um, so I think that's probably one of them, one of my favourites too. Um, but I just I just finished playing alongside Glenn Close in Sunset Boulevard on Broadway, and I feel like that that is that is the last time I sort of treaded the boards was on Broadway with Glenn Close, and I feel like if I never stood up on a stage ever again, I'd be happy with that wow. <laughs> because that the experience. I mean, the part wasn't. I mean, I was a supporting lead. Obviously, Glenn Close was the lead as Norma Desmond, and my part was Betty Schaefer. So I wasn't the lead lead, but I'm still I'm happy with that. I can hang up the, the shoes, you know, after uh, after that experience. Wow, but you, but I'm sure you won't. You're going to keep going. <laughs> yeah, I probably will. <laughs> I'm a when, when, when things when things thought... get back to normal. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't know how normal they're going to get. I'm be, be really interested to see, you know, because. And the thing is, if you think about like how these theaters are going to survive, because they're always in debt. Like the rent is so ridiculous. They're in like prime spots in the, the cities, in the center of cities. And I just feel like every every theater needs to sell out, needs to sell all of those seats to be able to pay the people that are performing on stage, people that are supporting the performers on stage. You know, like the building rent, like everything needs to be paid for. And if and if they're only having half the audiences due to the social distancing and whatnot, then I don't really see how they're going to be able to, right. I don't know, I just see how they're going to survive. So I don't know what that looks like. I don't know what the future of theatre looks like. I mean, I'm hopeful and I'm, I'm positive that things will be sorted, but it's it's an interesting time to really, really think about things that are important to you, you know? Yeah. So, yeah, I'm missing so, it. <laughs> yeah. So you recently had an album that got released, One Voice. Uh, tell us about that. Well, um, so, I mean, I don't want to go into too much detail, but, I mean, I had a record deal when I was 22 with Universal. It was pretty a pretty shitty experience, if I'm honest. Um, there was a load of executives telling me it was really important that I was completely honest and, and was very um, confident in my decisions and I knew exactly what I wanted and I needed to be sure. And, and then I had people working really close with me, like, you know, producers, and I'm not mentioning any names, but people that were working very close to me saying things like, oh, I know you don't like this, but it's fine. Trust me, it'll work. And then I kind of got into that 
really tricky position of being a very naive 22-year-old with a record deal, thinking that I'd won the lottery, but actually, as someone put it, I'd just bought a lottery ticket. Um, and I feel like I had a uh, very conflicting information and advice from all over the place one person saying to me you know you have to be headstrong and someone else saying to me you don't know anything trust me so ultimately the experience was a bit of a nightmare um i was dropped but before the album was released they were really sweet they gave me the album and all the rights and all the rest of it but consequently or subsequently i hadn't wanted to get back into the studio since then you know and then cut to 10 years later and a producer approaches me actually my friend steve steve anderson approaches me and says I think now is the time you know like you've been putting this off for so long I guess like fear of failure must have come into it as well because the experience was so bad and I was made to feel so so shit <laughs> that I was like I don't want to get back into a studio anymore because I can't do this like I just had I just didn't feel like it was something that I was able to do successfully um but in 2015 I became quite unwell um I actually had breast cancer and again like Steve just came to me afterwards and said I think this is definitely the time for you to you know, put your emotions into some songs and let's get it out there. And I was like, all right, I kind of, I'm down with that. Let's try. And so two of the tracks on the album, I mean, all of the tracks on the album really resonate with me. They're all covers. They're all songs that I've listened to over and over and over, or I've stumbled upon and it just really resonated with me. So they all have their stories, but there are two tracks on the album um, specifically that really um, reflect the way that I was feeling when I went through this, the health challenges in 2015. So, um, yeah, I mean, they're just very meaningful, poignant songs in my life. Um, just a collection of tracks that I that I love and wanted to share, you know, tell the story of. How did you decide, like, what tracks you wanted to use? Like, how, like, how much music did you listen to? Uh, well, the thing is, because I've been, like, thinking about recording songs for so long, it, there'd always be, there, there, there had always been a sort of... Um, like an unspoken list of songs that I would record if I had the opportunity again, kind of thing. So, I mean, the first track, for example, um, was uh, that I recorded was called She Used to Be Mine, which is from the musical Waitress. And it's actually one of two so musical theatre songs on the album. The rest of them are just like, they're sort of pop um, or folk. They're, they're, they're not actually musicals. So She Used to Be Mine was from Waitress, the musical. And, um, I heard the song and just sobbed my heart out and not because I even knew the musical that well, because I just heard the soundtrack. I hadn't actually seen the show, but because the lyrics were so heartbreaking, it's basically about a woman in a nutshell who sort of it suddenly dawns on her that her life is really not what it used to be. And, it, you know, there's a lyric of, um, you know, life just creeps into a back door. It's like this idea of things just happening to you. And then one day you wake up and realize that, you know, you're 20, 20 years down the line and like where did the life go and how did I get here and this was never the plan you know so then after my um, cancer diagnosis and I went through all the treatment I heard this song and I was just petrified that my life was going to just you know take an awful direction and and I wasn't going to be the person that I was before which actually is fine because <laughs> everything moves forward it's not I don't want to be the person that I was before but it still it was a concern so that one that one song was hugely poignant I recorded it uh, a long time ago, a couple of years ago now, um, and so I guess all the all the songs that I chose, they just resonated with me and a part of my life. And something that um, it was just, just it just had to be meaningful to me. It had to resonate. I had to tell the story as if I was sitting in front of an auditorium of people, you know, sharing my thoughts and emotions. Mm. So you know, every song does that. And I actually, actually on my YouTube channel, I've described, um, I've posted every song and i've described underneath of it where the inspiration to record it came from mm -hmm. so that, that that's in out there in the ether somewhere <laughs> cyberspace so like how long did it take you to put this whole album together well like yeah it's like five years wow. i mean because steve steve is based in the uk um and obviously i'm in los angeles so i would travel back for a week to see family or to audition for something or to do a little show or a gig or something. And then Steve would say, well, let's quickly snatch like an afternoon and, and record one of these tracks. So we would just like hop into the studio and, and over the course of, it's been realistically, it's more like four years. Yeah. We've been like back and forth with it. Now, um, the, recording here and there. So now for the listeners now, like where can they find the album? Well, it's on, um, it's on Spotify, it's on um, uh, Apple, it's got all the, the iTunes, Apple Music. It's also on my YouTube channel, um, but it's like streaming and obviously on Amazon too. It's kind of everywhere. 
It's the problem that have people find is that they can't spell my name. <laughs> people like I, it's so funny. People have messaged me on social media, being like, "It's taken me about two weeks <laughs> to work out how to track you down and how to find your album," because my name is spelled in the Irish way of Siobhan. So it's S I O B H A N, like B for Bravo, H for Hotel. It's sort of weird. <laughs> um, so there is no S H in there. There is no V for Victor in there. It's it's an Irish spelling. Mm. So yeah, um, my YouTube channel is Siobhan Dylan Official. Um, my Instagram is Siobhan Dylan Official. Uh, my Twitter is Siobhan Dylan UK. Um, but everything else, and, and my website is Siobhan Dylan as well. That's great. That's great. So whoever's listening to this, make sure you go and follow and listen. <laughs> yeah, please do. <laughs> and tell me what you think. <laughs> Siobhan, this is fun. Uh, thank you for coming on. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you for having me. That's a wrap. That's a wrap, everybody. That's a wrap. Thanks for listening to the Man Cave Chronicles podcast. I finally get my man cave. You can find us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at the MCC Podcast. And our website, themccpodcast.com. Until next time. Until next time.